Hello Internet! Welcome to Game Theory! And the final part of my FNAF timeline where today we're bringing our story to a close by talking about the most complicated and controversial part of the timeline, the part that I've been dreading most of all, the end. The moment where we're finally forced to come to some definitive and difficult answers trying to explain what the heck we were watching in Security Breach. The last two episodes have been about death. The death of Afton's family, the deaths of multiple children, the death of the franchise itself as Mike and Henry figure and literally burn it all down. Today's episode though, and the current end of this franchise, is instead all about rebirth, the return of old characters in new forms, and the controversial rebirth of a franchise entering the next era of its story. But before we hop into the timeline, due to scheduling conflicts, I won't be able to have any live talk back after this episode. I know, I promised one, I was really excited about it, but I just couldn't make it work with my schedule and all the other guests' schedules. That said, I still do plan on doing one over the coming weeks with special guests, just uh, make sure that you're subscribed and either have all notifications turned on or you're just watching our community tab for the announcement as to when that's gonna happen. And now without any further ado, we finally reach the end and a new beginning to our story. <laughs> Fazbear Entertainment was dead. There is no need for you to return to work next week as Fazbear Entertainment is no longer a corporate entity. All debts had been paid, all assets redistributed. The company was outright dissolved. Even the memories of the horrors that had happened there started to fade away in the public consciousness. The people were gone too. William was dead, Henry was gone. A whole generation of young Emilys and Aftons had lost their lives to the horrors of the pizzeria. All of them collateral damage to the man in the bunny suit. Everyone the company had ever touched was dead and gone. Well, all except one. Pay your child support, you deadbeat! I'm keeping the diamond ring. I also set the house on fire! Clara Afton. She'd been there in the early days, back when things with William were good. They'd had the perfect home, a thriving business, the ideal family. But shortly after their youngest son died, things started to change. William had become distant, lost in his work, obsessive. She had watched him change from this irritatingly brilliant man that she had fallen in love with to a drunken monster struggling to hold himself together. And despite her trying to reach out to him in those desperate for days, he was just too far gone. Admit it, you wanted to let me in. For her sake, she had to leave the relationship. And from there, she largely faded into obscurity. A mystery from William's past. A footnote in his history. And that was fine for her. She wanted to leave that part of her life behind. She tried to move forward, never wanting to hear the name Freddy Fazbear again. A time defined by mistakes and broken promises. But then, the paperwork started to arrive. As Fazbear Entertainment began to close as a corporate entity, suddenly her mail was flooded with notifications, requests, obligations. She had been there since the beginning, helping William in the early days of his business, and now, as a shareholder and sole living member of the Afton family, all copyrights and trademarks of both Afton Robotics and Fazbear Entertainment passed on to her. Memories of this past life that she had long left behind. Looking at the blueprints, the contracts, the memos, she felt old wounds begin to reopen. The regrets of a happy family that had been torn away from her. William had always been brilliant. That's what had attracted her to him in the first place. But he'd also been too blinded by obsession and pride. He was too jealous, too petty, too unable to actually see a bigger picture. But now, holding the paperwork that contained decades of heartbreak and trauma, she realized it was her turn. She was holding the power. This was her chance. And one thought resonated in her head. I will put them back together. I will put them all back together. She would be the one to rebuild this family. To rebuild the pieces of that shattered life to reclaim the kids that Fazbear had stolen from her. But how? Looking at William's work now laid out before her, she knew that he had been onto something. Collecting remnant, robotic humanoids, digital conscience transference. The pieces were all in place. They were just scattered, fragmented. It was almost like there were too many ideas going in too many different directions. It was such an important idea that she reiterated that point to herself. There were too many ideas going in too many different directions. That said, there had to be a way to save it all. She just needed to put it all back together. But how? To rebuild her family, she would first need to rebuild the franchise that had stolen them away from her. With ownership over the characters, their licenses, the technology patents, and the Fazbear name, she converted the corporation back to an LLC, a structure for smaller businesses that are usually family-owned. Ah. <sighs> 
The irony was fitting. From there, she would need Remnant, and lots of it. Remnant was the key. Clearly, in the later years of his life, William had been using Circus Babies Entertainment and Rentals as a remnant farm, sending robots to kids' birthday parties in the hopes of nabbing bits of the stuff here and there. But clearly, it wasn't enough. He had, what, like four, maybe five animatronics going out every week? No. It was a decent idea, but to get the remnant they required, it needed scale. Dozens, hundreds of animatronics all out there, all gathering remnant from unsuspected expecting customers, but to do that would require help, something William would never ask for. William had kept everything in-house. His obsession with control limited him. Clara, though, she wasn't nearly that precious. A plan like this required partners, people outside of Fazbear to do the heavy lifting. So she contacted a mid-sized delivery company, DLZ Shipping Solutions, to help build replicas of all the original animatronics. And with field delivery apps being all the rage, why not an animatronic delivery service? Order one to celebrate your birthday, your Halloween party. How about a fourth of July picnic. We'll invite Liberty Chica and 4th of July Freddy on over. She would make sure that they made skins for every occasion. Chocolate Bonnies for Easter, Shamrock Freddies for St. Patrick's Day, Dia de las Muertos Chicas. And thus, the Fazbear Funtime Service was born. That's right. With the Fazbear Funtime Service, you'll never be alone again. You'll always have someone watching your back. Was it ridiculous? Absolutely. Was it a sellout? Pfft. No doubt. It was exactly the sort of thing that William would have hated. But it needed to be done to get enough remnant. Normally, the novelty of ordering an animatronic wore off after, like, what, one, maybe two times? But with new skins for new holidays, suddenly you had yourself an animatronic perfect for every occasion. It would keep people hooked. It would keep them ordering the latest and greatest that Fazbear Entertainment LLC had to offer. And all the while, they'd be collecting and returning the remnant back to her. In a word, it was brilliant. There was just one problem with it. No one trusted the Fazbear name. The company's brand was still mud in the public eye. No one would want to hire animatronics from the restaurant franchise known for murdering children. Nothing kills a party quite like the threat of death, you know. So, she needed to find a way to discredit the stories that had come before. She needed to win back the public's affections, reactivate some nostalgia for the spooky stories of their childhoods. She needed a game. Multiple games, in fact. They lied to us. They lied to all of us. They told us that the whole point of this VR game was to undo the bad PR done by a rogue indie game developer. But that's not true at all. Those indie games were designed to conceal and make light of what happened. This isn't just an attempt to rebrand. It's an elaborate cover-up. Struggling game developers were a dime a dozen online, most working on their magnum opus between shifts at the Dollar General. So she found one. Steve just picked him out of obscurity, the right mix of desperate and doofus willing to say and do anything for a couple extra bucks. And he fell right in line, as expected, delivering stupid little things with dumb generic names like Mangle's Quest, Balloon Boy's Air Adventure, Five Nights at Freddy's. Bad gameplay with even worse graphics, but hey, they got the job done. People were suddenly talking about the clues inside of these things, searching for the hidden lore. They were actively making jokes about dead kids at pizzerias. Her husband's twisted history of serial murder had suddenly been reduced to a mere Nancy Drew mystery to be solved. The plan had worked. Freddy Fazbear's was suddenly more popular than ever. Things were going shockingly well. Her takeover and reboot of the franchise was full and complete. Suddenly infused with cash, she built the largest, most ambitious project yet, the Mega Pizza Plex. William had always been so visionary, but always thought so small scale. He was careful to a fault. Not her, though. She knew that this latest project needed to be big. It needed to be flashy. It needed to be a palace for children, a place that got people talking and checking out the latest in Fazbear products. So with a steady supply of remnant flowing in, it was finally time. The stage was set. It was time to get to her real goal, literally rebuilding a family. March 2035. The first was obvious. The crying child. Her little boy. The one that was the first to get ripped away from her. She'd seen down in his bunker that William had gotten very close to replicating artificial humans using animatronic technology. And so that's exactly what she would do. Rebuild her boy from the ground up using robotic parts. His shaggy brown hair, his favorite striped shirt, even down to small details that no one would notice, like the band-aid on his left knee. William's research had even found ways of making animatronics that could bleed and process food, making them virtually 
totally indistinguishable from a typical human, he would never have any idea of what he actually was unless he was explicitly told. The only things that could possibly ruin the illusion were any overrides to his internal systems. If something were to say, interfere with the cameras that he had in his eyes, or cause some sort of a core reboot to his hard drive, or x-ray his metallic bones, then yeah, he would be exposed. But otherwise, to the outside world, he was just your typical, normal human boy. She worked down in the bowels of the pizza plex giving him life, but it was one thing to build him, it was another to help him remember his identity. He died so young, so early in their history that there was no preserved memories for him. No documentation that she could just download into his digital brain. So bit by bit, she trained him, forcing him to remember who he was. In a corner of the room, she even made a makeshift dinner table, a reminder of their happier days. The family recreated two brothers, a sister, a father, and the mother at the head of the table. The one in charge, the one in command, the one bringing all of this to fruition. But his progress was admittedly slower than she would have liked. At first, he could only communicate through simple ones and zeros, then rudimentary drawings and crude letters. But bit by bit, images of his past life started to come through. Balloons, colors, houses, bears and faces, birthday parties, all for me. Gregory was alive. As the robot boy embraced her, she felt a warmth that she hadn't in decades. This, this was the joy that she'd been working towards. This was what it was all for. Her son, back in her arms again. The plan was working. He had to keep going. Next was William. If the family was truly going to be put together, she would need him. And she knew exactly where he was, in the ruins of that old Freddy Fazbear's pizza place where Henry had trapped him. In fact, that's specifically why she insisted on building the pizza plex there over the sinkhole. It was the best place to hide what her true intentions were with the entire operation. Digging through the wreckage, she found him. He was right where she thought he'd be. Seeing the putrid shell of the Springtrap suit, though, was not something she was prepared for. The rotting corpse of William Afton was disgusting. Scorched flesh fused into the fur lining, hollow black sockets where eyes once were, a smell that reeked of burned carbon and bloody iron. He was no longer flesh, he was just the tangled sinews of a creature that was once called human. How far this brilliant man had fallen. It was clear that her work was cut out for her on this one. Afton was practically lifeless. The man may not have been able to die, but he was about as close as you could come. And his body would need a lot of reconstruction. Replacement arms and endoskeleton reinforcements were the top priority, maybe pulled from their new line of glam rock animatronics. She'd have to see if they had any spare Bonnie parts lying around that they could steal. In the meantime, though, she threw the husk that was once her husband into a life support pod infused with aerosolized remnant to help keep him stable. But more important than recovering his body was recovering his mind. In his current state, he was comatose, an empty shell. Severe brain damage starts at temperatures over 108 degrees Fahrenheit. 42 degrees Celsius, and years of repeated fires had burned his brain to goo. Gone was the brilliant, frustrating mind that had drawn her to him in the first place. But she had a plan. Unlike her darling boy Gregory, Afton had found ways to record his consciousness. Fundamentally, the brain is only a series of electrical connections after all, so why couldn't you replicate that in the form of a standard circuit board? In essence, you could create a digital consciousness. And one thing she knew about William, he was nothing if not cautious. A planner. Someone who had backup plans to his backup plans. And sure enough, there it was, buried in piles of old animatronic CPUs, a record of Afton himself. But she needed someone to test it. Someone was definitely here during the night. It had to have been the client. I mean, they sent us that stuff in the first place with no explanation, told us to scan it, said it would expedite the process so we wouldn't need to program any pathfinding ourselves. Unlike the other games that she'd paid to have made in the past, this one had a different purpose. This wasn't about PR, it was about getting William back up and running, spreading his virus to the masses. You acknowledge that Fazbear Entertainment is not responsible for accidental digital consciousness transference, real world manifestations of digital characters. She hired a new developer, Silver Parasol Games, to scan the boards and bring her husband into the system. And because of the immersive nature of VR, William's consciousness would be able to merge with the player, giving him a new body, a new agency. There was just one complication. Afton's hold wasn't as powerful as she had hoped. He wasn't able to gain complete control. The first trial run, Jeremy, was so desperate to escape from his grasp that he sliced his own face off with a paper shredder. Messy. Afton's followers were reluctant, to say the least. But it was the second attempt that looked like it had the potential to kill two birds with one stone. Enter Vanessa. Mrs. Afton wanted a surrogate daughter. Her darling Elizabeth would have been a young woman at this point if she had lived. And Clara wanted someone who wasn't Elizabeth, but could be just like her. Could she have just rebuilt her like Gregory? Sure, but she decided against it because she wanted an actual human mother 
mother-daughter connection. Well, that, and it would be redundant and narratively unsatisfying to have two robot kids in the same family. What could she say? William had put a lot of tools on the table for her to use, and she was planning on using them all. Plus, Elizabeth had always been so loyal to Daddy. It was time to give her a second chance, a true choice. And Vanessa seemed to be the perfect candidate to fill the role. Your dad's name was Bill. Your dad didn't play fair, did he? He used to make your mom look bad in court. He manipulated you. I know your mom after she lost the custody case. I was supposed to be a good girl. She started as a QA tester at Silver Parasol Games, the VR game development company that was part of her plan to bring back William. But more importantly, Vanessa checked all the correct boxes. Right age, blonde, green eyes with a fondness for flowers and the outdoors. In many ways, it was her daughter all over again. Except it wasn't just looks and personality. What really mattered was Vanessa's mind. Underconfident, coming from a broken home, motherless, able to be manipulated. Yes, she would do nicely. She would be the one to save dear old daddy, just as the real Elizabeth would have wanted. I will make you proud, daddy. While testing the VR game, William's digital consciousness merged with Vanessa. Oh sure, she fought, fragmenting Afton's code into a series of tapes hidden across the game, trying to do web searches to regain control over her life, but it wasn't enough. She was weaker than Jeremy. She was a thrall that, despite occasional moments of lucidity, had to obey. And with Vanessa, it was a two-for-one deal. She was getting a daughter back, while also bringing her husband one step closer to reactivation. She just had to make sure that Vanessa was headed the right way. The reborn Gregory was an expert hacker, part of the benefits of being an Afton and a robot. So Clara had him keeping tabs on Vanessa, hacking into her emails and trailing her therapy sessions to ensure the future Elizabeth was falling in line. If any of the therapists started to ask too many questions, they were promptly dismissed from their positions. And while Gregory kept tabs on Vanessa's personal life, Mrs. Afton made sure to clear a path for her professionally. With Silver Parasol's collapse at the hands of the Anomaly, she then had the possessed Vanessa bring the contaminated circuit boards to DLZ shipping and the Fazbear Funtime service. More glitches, more remnant, more Afton. But it was her last move that was the best. In a true masterpiece of poetry, she brought Vanessa over to be chief security officer at the Pizzaplex. A true family tradition to don the hat and badge and all it took was a recommendation from the top as well as some emails marked for deletion. Sure, Vanessa didn't have relevant experience for the job, but when it comes directly from the CEO, does it really matter? Husband, son, daughter. A corpse, a robot, a human. All that was left was Michael. Poor, troubled Michael. The boy that killed her youngest. The one that would spend years trying to make his guilty conscience right again. A self-professed protector. While she knew she needed him to complete the family, something told her that the problem had already solved itself. Something had shifted when using Glamrock Freddy to excavate the buried pizza place. I have been here before. I found myself for the first time when I cleared the path. I have changed. My friends are here, but I can protect you. I am not. Me. Maybe it was the remnant that had coursed through Michael's veins. Maybe it was the spirit of Michael living on as a protector. But he was there, somewhere inside of Glamrock Freddy. She could feel it. And just like that, she'd won. She'd done it. Sure, there were still some kinks to work out, some final brainwashing of Vanessa, some rehabilitation of William, but they were there. Finally, all together again under one roof, the Aftons reunited. A happy ending. And that's how it could have ended. That's how it should have ended, had it not been for a few unanticipated developments. For one, something was just wrong with the Pizzaplex. Almost as if the entire building was haunted, possessed. Puppet plushies hiding on ceilings, behind crates, places that they had no earthly way of belonging. Staff bots with greasy tears down their eyes acting like they were being puppeteered by some sort of a nightmare. Even their sounds had the echo of nightmares long past. <laughs> It was as though a guardian spirit of the past refused to move on. As long as her husband was around, it too would linger. Only now, it wasn't just in one body, but it was in the essence of the building itself. She had seen stories of houses built on burial grounds getting possessed by angry spirits, but she'd never assumed that it could be real. Then again, in a world of living spirit metal and mind-controlling glitches, who was she to be so judgmental? The whole thing was ridiculous. Why would this be the line that she refused to cross? After all, the Pizzaplex was built over the burial ground of angry spirits, but it was the power cords that finally convinced her that something was wrong. Suddenly, these cords were striped black and white, like the security puppet from generations ago. The very foundations of this place, the materials and wires that constituted it, were rebelling against her, against the Aftons, against the quest to bring them all together again. 
and it was being helped by something else. Something slithering through the building. Maybe they were connected, she couldn't be sure, but a blob of living wires could be heard oozing through the walls, stealing pieces and parts of the old animatronics showcased in Rockstar Row. She could only assume that it was a byproduct of all the remnant they'd been collecting. From Afton's testing, she knew that both light and dark remnant existed, one of positive emotions and the other created from anguish, anger, agony. Perhaps this, this thing was an amalgamation of all the darkest parts of the pizzeria's history, a collection of the hatred still housed inside these defunct endoskeletons and exosuits. As long as it was left alone, it seemed to be harmless. But if any Afton outside of Michael got too close, it would lash out wildly. Even young Gregory, looking to punish the family that had been complicit in its horrible creation. Little did she know, though, that Gregory should have been her biggest concern, that bringing the family together would have some unforeseen consequences. Gregory was normally the goodest of boys. She had literally built him that way. But lately, he'd been disappearing more and more often, disobeying her orders, <laughs> requests. She knew that he loved playing on the arcade machines once the Pizzaplex closed, being so good as to top the leaderboard on practically all of them. But lately, he was nowhere to be found. She suspected his absence had to do with Glamrock Freddy's failed performance the other night, when he malfunctioned live on stage, almost as though the core programming of Freddy responded to seeing this rebuilt small boy, almost like it awakened something inside of him. She'd have to make sure that Vanessa was on the lookout for him, but she'd soon come to learn that Vanessa wasn't enough. Whether it was the influence of the Nightmare Puppet or a reawakened hatred of animatronics seated deep in Gregory's code, something had caused him to rebel, to rip apart each animatronic in the Pizzaplex. Bit by bit, this boy was tearing down the empire that she'd so painstakingly built, freeing Vanessa from her mind control, destroying the remains of Afton in the basement, setting Glamrock Freddy loose. As her carefully created world crumbled around her one more time, she began to plot her revenge. She would have to bring them all to ruin. And there you have it, my friends, nearly a decade in the making, my FNAF timeline for where the franchise is here in 2023, the year of Fazbear Frights, by the way. As always, it wouldn't be right for me to finish without going over some of the more controversial takes that I just handed out. I think we can all agree that this part of the timeline was always going to be the hardest. So let me just break down some of the major points. First of all, the biggest swing of this episode, and obviously the one that everything else rests upon, Mrs. Afton being the CEO of Fazbear Entertainment LLC. Here's why I went with this route. Now, first and foremost, the head of Fazbear Entertainment is the single biggest mystery that we're meant to solve at this point in the lore. The ultimate guide brings it up repeatedly. Who's running the show? Who is okaying these decisions? And in the security breach memos, we get multiple mentions of someone manipulating things from the top down. Whoever this is, they are the person driving forward every other facet of late stage FNAF lore here. They're the puppet master who's hiring the indie dev. They're the ones relaunching the brand, building the pizza plex over the burial ground. So everything at the end of the timeline relies on this one singular answer. Now, as I see it, there are two possibilities here. One, an adult robot Elizabeth, like we see older versions of robot kids in the fourth closet, or Mrs. Afton. Could it be someone completely new to the franchise? Absolutely yes, but in a game with so many returning faces and repeated themes, it would be pretty random and arbitrary. So, between these two girl bosses, who then would it be? Well, Elizabeth always wants to please her daddy, so she'd be most likely wanting to bring him to life. But then, what's Vanessa's role in all of this? Vanessa is clearly meant to be a parallel for Elizabeth. Same hair, same eyes, similar backstories, but if the main goal is getting the Afton family back together, which seems to clearly be the case in Security Breach, then there's no need for Vanessa to be involved at all. We already have Elizabeth running the show. It would also mean that we suddenly have two robot kids running around, which feels narratively repetitive and quite frankly kind of dumb. Now look at Mrs. Afton. We know next to nothing about her outside of any clues that we can get from Immortal and the Restless and Ballora's song. But what her being head of Fazbear does is make every other piece of the lore fit. Suddenly, you can have one of every other type of character. One robot kid in Gregory, one brainwashed human in Elizabeth slash Vanessa, one OG corpse in William, and one possessed animatronic in Mike. Narratively, it makes everything else cleaner. Legally, it's also the option that makes the most sense. As I call out in my narrative, she'd likely have some stake in the original company and all of its assets. So as Fazbear folds as a company, I'd suspect a lot of it would return back to her. But there was one clue that really sold me on this particular direction, and that was 
this right here. In the post-it room. The big lore central of Security Breach. A dinner table scene with the whole family, including the mother. And not only is she there, she is at the head of that table. The position of highest honor and responsibility. She is the one in charge with William being relegated off to the side. That one scene shows that we have to include mom in there somewhere. And the only place it makes sense for her to be is at the top. Now there is one big dilemma with my interpretation of all this. The ultimate guide really seems to point out that the head of Fazbear doesn't want the glitch trap virus to spread. They call out one particular email in FNAF AR where the legal team calls a cease and desist to all action about scanning the circuit boards. And even in FNAF VR, we're told that the circuit boards get stolen back by the client, presumably once they realize what danger is on there. Trying to stop glitch trap before he spreads and gets out of hand. Here's the problem with that though, if the head of Fazbear doesn't want Afton to rise again, why'd they restart the company in the first place? Why'd they build over the FNAF 6 pizzeria? Why'd they go through an elaborate cover-up to make the possessed Vanessa an important part of the company? Just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It would be the most inconsistent series of actions ever, but I did want to call attention to it since it seems to be the route that the official guide is trying to steer us towards. Moving on to minor point number one, the Five Nights at Freddy's games were made by the rogue indie developer. Here's the thing, FNAF VR opens with this line. That's why we have recreated many of these completely fictitious scenarios, lies, that you've been fed over the last several years into a hilarious VR game. It's recreating the lies told to you by the indie developer. And since Help Wanted has direct recreations of FNAFs 1 through 3, it means the games must be part of the fabrications that this developer made up. Also, all of this is heavily implied in the story of the same name, Help Wanted and Tales of the Pizzaplex, hence FNAF 1 through 3, canon games within the lore of the series. Big swing number two, the elephant, or ghost in the room, Charlie infecting the Pizzaplex. John from the channel FNAF has made some great findings about Charlie's influence over over the pizza plex, the cables that looked like the striped arms of the puppet, the nightmare own plushies that you find hidden across the pizza plex in weird places, the staff bots with creepy smiles and in your dreams written on the front, all of these things scream puppets. Plus, with the puppet mask not having tears in the blob, seems to imply that Charlie's spirit exists elsewhere. She is still in play, and she has an important role, especially in Gregory's post-it room. The doors to the post-it room in the game's code are called Charlie doors, and inside we see a bunch of lit up nightmare staff bot heads. Suspicious, to say the least. The channel ID Fantasy did a great theory looking at the post-it notes, concluding that the crying child slash Gregory isn't alone in this room, but rather might be communicating with someone. A spirit, Charlie. Charlie's spirit seems to have pulled a poltergeist. Instead of controlling one thing, she's affecting a lot of little details. Foundational elements of the Pizzaplex. And this isn't the first time that we've seen this in the franchise, either. We've seen spirits communicating with people through physical writing in the survival logbook. So we know that this is an established means of spirit communication within this franchise. And I suspect that to some extent it might be Charlie's influence making Gregory go haywire. Which brings me then to my final and probably biggest controversy in recent FNAF history, Gregory as Patient 46, the evil robot mastermind. Now, I know when I first came out with this theory a year ago, people were mad. But here's the thing, you don't have to take my evidence points for it anymore. The recent Tales from the Pizzaplex story, GGY, basically goes and just outright proves it. In GGY, we find out about a boy named Gregory who's getting all the high scores in the Pizzaplex arcade machines. When therapists start to go missing, it's confirmed that GGY is the one that's working to bump them off. And when animatronics start getting corrupted by a mysterious glitch, GGY's letters are found inside the code. He even chooses the code name Dr. Rabbit for crying out loud. But obviously by the time of security breach, Gregory is working against Burn Trap, Vanessa, and the animatronics. Why? How? Well, it's not really clear. I tend to believe that something must have happened to cause him to either lose his memory or be reset in some way. Maybe it was Charlie talking to him in his post-it room. Maybe he hit his head. Maybe it was the connection that he made with Mike on stage in Glamrock Freddy. Not exactly sure, and I don't think we have enough clues to solve any of it yet. But it makes sense from a story perspective why he'd start off evil on Afton's side, and then switch to trying to destroy him and not knowing who he is in Security Breach. And with that, my friends, I'm wrapping this thing up. Congratulations, we are on page 40. 22,000 words of FNAF, baby. Practically just wrote myself a Tales of the Pizzaplex short story. Have I answered everything? No. Does everything fit cleanly? No. But does it feel like the best and most cohesive narrative for all these characters that addresses most of the evidence we're given? Yeah. For me, honestly, it really does. And let's be honest with ourselves, the DLC will probably come out later this year and prove me completely wrong. Wouldn't be the first time. Then comes the movie, whatever, my descent into madness continues. But regardless, I am so proud of this. This was a massive undertaking. And I'm so proud of our editors who have just destroyed the editing across all four of these installments. You guys are the best. Thank you for pushing through on 20 plus minute uploads, you are unreal, and you're
your talent is unrivaled. I'm so lucky to work with you guys every single day. And like I mentioned before, keep an eye on the channel for an announcement regarding a talkback live stream with some special guests. Was I right? Was I wrong? I want to hear your feedback. So that one's coming up soon. And with that, my friends, we can finally rest. I can leave the demon to its demons with one final reminder that it was all just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching.